few years back, I decided that I wanted to build myself another trailer. I knew that I wanted to build something longer, wider, and heavier duty than any of the other trailers I had built or owned up to that point. So with the design in mind, I began to slowly accumulate material. As I came across remnants that I knew I would be able to use, I put them up on my iron rack, away from all my other remnants, knowing that I would eventually revisit them. I also knew that I wanted tandem axles with electric brakes and a minimum of a 6,000 pound rating per axle. So I kept my eyes peeled on the local classifieds. Now having owned, built, and borrowed a few trailers over the years, I knew that my ultimate trailer would be a tandem axle deck over. A deck over trailer is a trailer that has the deck over the axles, meaning the entire trailer deck is usable space. You're not working around fenders. When you're doing a lot of forklift loading and unloading of larger or longer materials, this is incredibly desirable. When you put the trailer deck above the axles, it can really make for a tall trailer deck. Now this can be a positive thing, but it can also be a negative thing. In addition to the lack of fenders, another positive could be on a job site, it makes for a great work surface, a comfortable height to work off of. But on the downside, you now have a very high center of gravity. When you're moving equipment or cars or other heavy items, this is definitely not a good thing. So when I initiated this trailer build, I had spent a lot of time going through the different manufacturers, designs, their flaws, things that I didn't like, things that I did like, and knew in my mind that I was going to be building a 26 foot deck over trailer 102 inches wide with tandem axles a minimum of 6,000 pound rating per axle and I was going to put 14 and a half inch low profile rims as well as low profile tires in order to keep my deck height as low as possible the further that I got into my project and the more people that I talked to about my project the more my plans began to change but for what it's worth, that change isn't going to come until later. As far as we're concerned now, this guy in the video is still building a 26-foot deck over trailer. Now this is the deck frame. This part was going to tilt on top of the subframe. And what I'm doing is I'm taking six additional feet and scabbing it onto the 20-foot sections. I did laser level everything, make sure that it's perfectly in plane. And I'm just doing a butt weld on here, knowing that I would be plating the back side. And the best way to get two identical frame rails is just, just simply build them on top of each other. Now this was a fall winter project. And I was hoping to be able to keep this project inside of the shop for the most part. But it ended up being too wide and too long. Just barely which means I need a bigger shop. Well, the next best option is building it on the apron. So I went ahead and set up all the workhorses out here and laser leveled again. Once I had the side rails parallel, I added the rear member, which was a piece of two by two quarter wall box tubing. This matched up perfectly with the knife edge rear frame rails. And now I'm giving Mrs. United States of Build the I need a bigger shop sales pitch. This is where having that 50 foot logging tape comes in really handy. Once you know both of your parallel sides are of equal length, there's several different methods that you can use for checking square. There's the 345 method, there's the cross checking method, which I prefer. Or if you have a big fixed string square, you can also use that. This is just a little template I made up. It's a piece of inch and a half square tubing, just welded onto a, a scrap piece of angle iron here. This is mimicking the lumber that will eventually make up this trailer deck. And I'm just using it to clamp and that's giving me the, the recess down that I need. 
So as you've probably figured out, these are all the cross members that are going in. There are two heavy duty box tubing cross members going in. One at the rear pivot point and one where the hydraulics will mount. All of the other cross members are 3x3 three three angle iron. I should mention that a majority of this trailer was welded with 7018. 8 inch mostly, but some 532nd on a lot of the heavier iron. I thought I'd give a little recap of where we're at, what I've done over the last couple of evenings, and what the overall goal is. So it's 26 feet from the front of the deck to the back of the deck tongue not included and what I've done is I've come through with 3 inch by 3 inch angle iron on 16 inch centers for the front cross members and they're set down one and a half inches to compensate for the wood debt and then I've got chain tie downs on the inside of the frame rail every 16 inches also and they're all going to be tied in together to give it more reinforcement the back four feet here will be diamond plate and I've got the two axles here, 12,000 pound torsion axles that will sit right inside of here with diamond plate over top. Overall width is 101 and a half. I've knife edged the rear two feet of it, comes up. This is five inch C-channel and it, it reduces down to two inches here on the very end. I've got two inch by two inch square tubing on the back. And it's got LED tail lights that will be inset, and then it's going to have the markers in the center. You can see here what we've done on the cross members. This is 3 inch by 3 inch, quarter inch wall angle iron, butts up into here, set down an inch and a half, and then we have this 5 inch channel welded on the flat side on the back. This gives us a lot of weld surface here, and this is for your chains to drop down and uh, hook onto. Now, since I don't have a flat surface large enough to weld this on, I've taken my laser level and I've set up all my work stands to be in a perfect plane and then I set my trailer on top of that and so this thing is perfectly laser leveled right now and that was the best solution for me to be able to build this thing to be perfect. When laying out all of these other cross members I've measured from one constant spot which would be the front corner of that trailer instead of setting a cross member and then measuring the next cross member off of that cross member what happens when you do that let's say you set that cross member one eighth of an inch off or during tack up it happens to twist a tiny bit now if you're measuring off of that one and it's one eighth off every single consecutive cross member will be off if you measure from the same constant spot in the very front corner every cross member is measured from that spot and will be consistent throughout same goes if you're laying out a building or if you're framing a wall measure from one constant spot don't measure as you go down so for instance here we're laying out our next cross member which is basically going to be the opening for our wheels and I've measured from that cross member I've measured from the front corner of the trailer and then I just double checked off of one of my rear cross members just to ensure consistency on that cross member I now know that that cross member is in the perfect location down to the milli inch so now I've got a perfect mark here to reference off of with an X marking what side the cross member is actually going to be located on and any any error from here on out is basically just going to be a reflection of my ability to fixture that and weld it in place. But these are the pockets where the tires are going to ride. I'm using torsion axles. That's what became available first. They're not my first choice. I think leaf springs are a little more forgiving when it comes to being overloaded. But now having used these and run them, I've been very satisfied. Now another quick note, these rear cross members that will be supporting the diamond plate, I did tighten those up to a 12 inch center.
I decided it would be a lot easier to cut out all the stake pocket holes now with the plasma cutter as opposed to doing it later with a cutoff wheel. Now here I'm doing my layout and the way that I based my layout was with that eighth of an inch diamond plate being set back one quarter inch from the edge of the square box tubing. I knew that if I had flushed everything up with the end, that diamond plate would have been very susceptible and prone to upturning any type of bending and damage just because of that natural curve in the box tubing. Not only that, but it also gave me a nice lap weld. We're taking all the welds down on the tops of those cross members. Anything that's proud is getting flushed up. Now this plate is sitting very nicely across all these cross members and you can see where it's clamped. It's clamped across that rear member only and I'm doing a bunch of tack welds across the bottom side of that only on the rear member. And I'm also making sure that I skip around a lot in order to not introduce a lot of heat into that plate. Alright we've got this on here with a little bit of a shim here on the second to last cross member. We're going to clamp down real hard. Whenever you're welding a big plate like this down, you want to start in the center and work out. Or start on one side and work over. Reason being, you don't want to trap a high spot or any type of bubble in the center. Anytime this deck plate and the lower cross members had any type of a gap, I would take a piece of welding rod or scrap piece of metal and clamp it between this channel iron and the deck plate in order to really force that particular section down. Any gap between your deck plate and your lower cross members is a potential rattle. Now that the bones of the deck are finished, it's time to move on to the subframe. The main rails for the subframe of this trailer was some big 7 inch channel that I was able to salvage. It had been used on a project prior and it was some pretty rough stuff with a bunch of bracketry welded on. Not sure if the camera will show it, but whatever these channel irons were used for in their previous life, they do have a slight bend in them, and that's what I'm working on overcoming right now. I'm hoping we can salvage them. My thought here was that if I could use the subframe that these axles came on as a frame jig for these big 7 inch channels. What I could do is slowly work my way down these channels, welding in the cross members and straightening them as I go. The 25 foot Stanley Fat Max tape measure, hands down the best tape measure for the price. I haven't met another one that even comes close.
you can never own too many clamps. determination that I need to make is whether I have enough material here left to bend in and meet my my center beam that will be my tongue my trailer tongue now what I would prefer is for for these two ends these end beams that come in and triangulate to the center beam I would prefer for them to protrude a little bit beyond the front deck of the trailer and uh, the way that I'm going to determine that is by using a piece of string. Now I know that these are five feet, so I'm going to make a mark at five feet and at ten feet and mock it up with the string. Now this doesn't have to be NASA accurate, but just enough that I can get an idea, know as to whether I have enough material here or if I need to add in additional material. Take that measurement over here, 13 feet, 2 inches, Twelve, thirteen. So I know that when, when that triangulation hits my center beam, it'll be one foot past the front of my trailer deck. I purchased these torsion axles used locally. But I was able to cross-reference the serial numbers and figure out how many degrees of travel they were rated for. And then I was able to translate that to total tire and wheel movement so I knew how much to notch out my frame rails. Now my forklift is rated to, I want to say, 3,500 pounds. And it didn't really ever have any trouble lifting up this, this trailer project in any of the stages that it was in. I was able to get the frame rails fairly straight, all the cross members tacked into place and manipulated to where I was pretty happy with it. But I wanted to use the trailer deck to really square it up and clamp it down before I did the final weld out and really put the heat to it. I immediately noticed that when I set the weight of this subframe on the deck frame I got a little bit of sag in the center and I think the main reason for this was that I had already cut out the wheel openings out of the outside C channel. So what I've done is centered this subframe and clamped it down exactly where it will be located except for on the top of the trailer deck. All right, I've got a mark here at 14 feet measured from the back on both sides. And I'm taking a piece of used welding rod here. And I'm clamping that exactly at 14 feet for me to hang my tape measure on. And now I'm gonna cross check this for square. 
As I mentioned earlier, there are a few different techniques that you can use to square something up like this. Personally, I tend to just turn to the cross-checking method. And if I do happen to be at a square, I find that a ratchet strap is just so easy to use. A lot more user-friendly than trying to fixture a bar clamp in there. And they're cheap and readily available. Now fortunately for me, everything was close enough that I was able to manipulate it into place using just the ratchet strap and bar clamps as I worked from the rear of the trailer to the front. If it had been really far out, I would have been tack welding this subframe to the trailer deck as I worked my way forward just to ensure zero movement. And after a nice dinner break, it's back outside to burn a few more pounds of rod doing the final weld out. A funny story, a long, long time ago, I had a similar scenario as this, welding in front of my shop really late at night, and my elderly neighbor pulled in and hopped out of his car and came strolling up, which was very odd considering how late it was. And he explained to me that he was really relieved because he had been standing on his front porch looking up at the sky trying to figure out why we were having a lightning storm considering the weather and then he figured out that the flashing was coming over the treetops and not from the sky so that's when he proceeded to hop in his car and cruise up and down the road to try to figure out what was going on as he drove past my house the arc light caught his eye and he pulled in and explained all this to me And this is the trailer tongue. It's a piece of 3x5 box tubing with a quarter wall thickness. And my steel yard happened to have this remnant. Otherwise you have to buy the full 20 foot stick or buy the pieces that you need and pay the restocking fee. I really wanted to have three points of contact with my subframe and that's why you can see that second to last cross member added in there from some scrap that I had left over. And this is what we mocked up earlier just using the makeshift strings to figure out where the frame rails would intersect with the trailer tongue. I'm not an expert by any means, but I certainly have an opinion. And I feel like in a situation like this, if you can avoid completely severing that piece of metal and re-welding it back on, your alignment and your final product is going to look a little bit better. That's why I'm just removing the pie cuts and folding the rest in. And since you've watched me weld plenty, I've skipped that part, but you can see that the subframe is 90% complete. I've set it on top of the axles, and now I'm going to set the trailer deck on just to, just to check for fit and function. And that pretty much concludes all the work that takes place in part one. 
Be sure to tune in for part two, where the project takes a major right turn. We work through some major design changes. We get this trailer deck much closer to the ground, and we mess around with some hydraulics. As always, thanks a million for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one. Say it like that. Welcome back. Welcome back to the second installment of our DIY tandem axle 26 foot bumper tow trailer build series. If you watched the first installment, you know that this trailer began life as a deck over. But as you're about to see, that's going to quickly change. After piecing the trailer together into its final height at the end of the last video, I had a few days to observe it and I decided that it was going to be way too top heavy and way too tall when tilted. After revisiting the drawing board and jotting down a few schematics, I concluded that I could reduce the overall weight of my trailer by several hundred pounds and lower the deck height by about 14 inches if I converted from a deck over trailer to a beaver tail. So as you can see, the first order of business was to remove the section of frame rail that was above the wheels. Now fortunately, the plans for the rear pivot didn't change. All the materials I had were still adequate. All of these measurements are checked and then double checked and oftentimes they're checked with multiple items of precision measurement. And I did edit out a lot of the measuring later on in the video. The absolute best and most consistent way to lay out a trailer that's going to track down the road nice and straight and have good consistent tire wear is to triangulate your toe point with your axles and that helps you line your axles up straight underneath that subframe. So what we've got is we've got the tape clamped to the dead center of the tongue and we're coming back here and we're just going to lay out where the axle is going to be on either side of the frame here. And I've switched over from a fat chalk pencil to a scratch awl which is going to give me a very sharp mark. These are the notches where the axles sit. This is a design that I'm copying off the original subframe and I think it is a really good design. Not only does it hold the axle captive, but it also lowers the overall height of the trailer deck a full two and a half inches because the axle is set up into the subframe. Now something that's important to keep in mind when you do make a notch up into a frame rail like this is to use a rounded corner. You don't want a square hard corner a square corner is very susceptible to stress cracking. And since I wasn't reusing any of the old hardware, I just hacked it all out of there.
Now I just wanted to temporarily mock this up so that I could lift the deck and see what my load angle was going to be. And once I had this thing lifted up, it became quite clear that I had made the right choice. This thing was way too steep to safely load anything larger than a car. And bear in mind, this is with the overall height lowered 14 inches. And now I needed to configure my hydraulics in a way that maximized their lift potential, but also maintained a fair amount of ground clearance. As I mentioned earlier, a great deal of time went into aligning these plates, measuring them, checking them, and rechecking them. And I edited a lot of that out just in order to keep the video short. While the trailer deck frame was still one piece, I wanted to fully weld it to the pivot because this was a foolproof way to maintain alignment once it was fully welded out, then I was able to cut it and everything was perfectly aligned. Now once I knew what full lift and full lower needed to be, then I was able to configure the second end of the hydraulic mounting points. And I knew that I wanted to tie them into at least three cross members to help carry the strain of lifting any significant amount of weight that was ever going to be on the beaver tail end of the trailer. Now one significant detail that I did neglect to record, and I should mention now, is that when I cut these pinholes in these brackets, I slightly oversized them, and then I came back through with a weldable shaft collar, and I made sure that these hydraulic cylinders were perfectly in sync with each other and aligned, and then I welded the shaft collars on, and those are the mounting points. The shaft collars not only bear all of the weight, but they also double as the pin retainers. So the next order of business was to tackle the fenders. I'm just using a salvaged piece of 8th inch diamond plate or tread plate. I've fixed, straightened, repaired and even replaced quite a few trailer fenders over the years. In my experience, a nice square, boxy, simple design always seems to hold up the best. I've just made a few gouge marks or score marks here with my plasma cutter by moving at a fast pace without cutting all the way through. What this allows me to do is just tack my fender into place and fold it accordingly instead of running it in the brake and then checking fitment and then running back to the brake adjusting and then checking fitment. I can just bend it in place to fit perfectly the first time.
As I mentioned earlier, I did buy these axles used, but I was able to run the serial number and find out how much axle travel they have. And then I was able to set my fenders nice and low, knowing that they weren't gonna bottom out. Now you could break an edge or weld on some one inch flat bar onto this fender, but I've had really great luck just using round bar. Nice soft edge, gives it plenty of reinforcement, and it looks nice by the time you're done. What I did here was I got them all tacked into place and then I ran a piece of bar across both fenders to make sure that both tops were perfectly flat and parallel to the trailer deck. Now the front trailer deck is still not welded down to the subframe, but the rear beaver tail is part of the subframe. So I want to do a final mock-up here and let this beaver tail operate under its own power using the hydraulic power unit. This red piece of box tubing is what was keeping that tail suspended prior to the hydraulics being in and pressurized. I'm gonna leave that two by two angle iron partially over the diamond plate, just so I can measure when the tail is in plane with the rest of the deck. Now this is just a single acting hydraulic power pack. It pressurizes only on the upstroke. For the downstroke, it relies on gravity and the weight of the tail. Now according to the calculations that I ran, this tail itself should be able to lift three to four tons, which is more than I'll ever put on it. Okay, it's been a while since I filmed anything on the trailer here, but you can see we've got the locking mechanism all engineered. I just basically have to get those springs tensioned correctly. We've got a handle here, a little label cut out on the Langmuir, ramp up, ramp down, got all the light plates in, all the way down, up here, there, 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 got the tie down hooks on the bottom and it's all fully welded out. We've got all the hydraulic hose retainers in place and we've got some wire loops. Zip tie the wire loom to that all the way up. So time to pressure wash, go quality control on all the welds and if it's good then we paint You know, if you've got a big job like this to degrease, it's a really big hassle to wipe the whole thing down. And I've personally had extremely good luck using cheap dishwashing soap like this from the dollar store, along with something like Simple Green or Purple Power like this product, which are very cheap by the gallon also. And I just put those in this Hudson sprayer, spray down whatever the object might be, and then hit it with a really high quality pressure washer.
so today we're going to be painting this trailer. I'm going to be hitting it with some primer and then a top coat. It's kind of a unique situation because there is some repurposed steel on here. Some of this stuff already has a primer coat on it. Some of it has some paint on it. Some of it is raw and new. So it's kind of a unique situation. And so what I'm going to be doing just to just to keep this project under budget I'm going to be taking a bunch of my remnant rust-oleum, some of the off colors, dumping them in with my primer coat, and then I'll come over with my top coat, which is going to be a black. And that's going to stretch the paint a little bit further. It's a good way to get rid of those partial cans of paint that seem to just kind of hang around. And it's going to give us the maximum amount of material to spray on this trailer, which is going to give us the maximum amount of protection. It's a win-win. Okay, look at this. Look at this random assortment here. We have a little bit of yellow, a little bit of black. I think I got some gray here. I've got a little bit of a blue, blue gunmetal gray. I've got a bunch of parcels of black in varying gloss types. So this is going to be mayhem, but this is exactly why we keep those partial cans around for projects like this, where we need good, thick undercoating primer coating, base coating, before we lay our color on. So we're going to use all these up, no money wasted. We're going to come in under budget on this project. Okay, first things first, I happen to have a two gallon bucket, which is going to be absolutely perfect. Um, I've got my cordless drill and tip number one, you know, dollar store whisk. It's going to be a lifesaver. It's going to make this job a lot easier. Let's start popping lids and dumping some paint in here. We'll see what kind of crazy color we come up with. Now this is something that you probably wouldn't want to do on a top coat unless it was a one-time type of deal. Something like this is like 99% impossible to match unless you write your formula down. So probably prime coat only. But yeah, what a, what a great way to not have to waste paint. Now another thing to keep in mind is brand compatibility. These are all Rust-Oleum. I don't, I have one can that's off brand. I don't have any qualms about dumping that in because I am 100% certain that these are all alkyd enamels, oil based, which is kind of a, a certain type of chemical composition that falls under the big umbrella that is oil based. Alkyd enamel. Readily available, durable, great for industrial applications. Not only that, but with Rust-Oleum you have the huge benefits of spraying it in bulk, possibly scratching it up at some point, and being able to touch up with a rattle can. All right, look at this one. This was a partial can. It was probably about a fifth of the way full, a quarter of the way full. Caved in edge, didn't quite seal right. Check it out. Gelled up, dried. but we might be able to mix that in. We're pouring through a filter so it's worth a shot. Another thing to bear in mind, you definitely want to scrape the bottom of these cans if they're older, if they've been sitting a while. A lot of the pigments and the solids that you'll need are going to settle out to the bottom. You'll want to scrape those out, mix them in, and really resuspend them throughout the composition. Uh, look at that. You don't want that going in there. Okay, we'll get this mixed up. One thing to note, I will not be thinning this or adding any type of activator into it while it's in bulk. I'll be doing that separately once I'm mixing by the cup, the spray cup. You know an old painter once taught me a trick. He said, hold your mixer at 45 degrees to your product. He said, otherwise what's happening is you're spinning everything at their respective layers and they're not mixing top to bottom. He said, when you hold it at 45 degrees, you're forcing a thorough mixing throughout the entire bucket. Okay, our magic number for today is going to be four parts paint. We're going to bump our, we're going to cut back on our solvent a tiny bit because we're going to be using the siphon feed gun, which means it'll handle a little bit heavier of a material. And instead of activating the primer coat, the base coat, 
we're going to be just adding in a little bit of Japan dryer. It's technically activating it. It's just that it's not. We're not using a catalyst, a hardener. We're using Japan dryer, which is salt based. It's still going to kick it off very quick. It's going to allow us to recoat rapidly, but it's not going to add any gloss or any hardness. So we're going to go four, one and a half, and then we're going to add in one cap full of Japan dryer. All right, if that's not thin quite enough, we can do a little bit of additional thinning while it's already in the cup. Always pour through a filter. Can't emphasize that one enough. That's gonna save you a world of heartache. See all that scuzz? That would have ended up in the paint gun. It would have clogged the tip and it would have called it, caused us all kinds of problems. Okay, filter respirator is a must. Always cover your unsprayed product. Also a must. All right, now we've got our top coat here. I used a gloss black and kind of a grayish color. And as I mentioned, if you're doing this as a top coat, you really want to make a notation of your mix ratios. This is plenty of paint for me to get through this trailer. In fact, I might even have some left over. And by the time I need to worry about repainting this trailer again, this type of paint's probably gonna be illegal anyway. So the current task at hand is to wire up the back of this trailer. We've got the three lights that turn on with the running lights in the center of this trailer and then we've got the two strip LEDs on each side that are stop, turn, and running light. We'll start here, go to the center of the light with our three, leave ourselves a tiny bit of slack, and we're going to kind of run this through to here, and then I'm just going to make little sharpie mark behind each light about where it's going to fall. So just marking these wires. All right, we've got our piece of chase rod here, a couple of pieces of TIG wire. If I was pulling through a really tight area, I would stagger these wires, but this is basically an inch and a half by inch and a half on the inside. I think what's holding us up from being able to just push the wires through is those little slugs that I cut out for the light. Easy as pie. So we're just gonna fish that out. All right, there's our first one. 
right there. And we need the brown. I'm using these connectors. I have the solder and the heat streak tube built in. I wasn't really sure what to make of these things. And then I, I keep seeing all these people using them and talking about how great they are. And I thought, you know, this is a perfect place to try them out. It's a personal project. And it's a trailer, it's not like inside of a vehicle or anything like that. So if anything did short out, it's not real, a real big hazard. So yeah, I thought I'd give them a shot. You know, this, this is about the fourth connection I've done and I'm fairly impressed with them. Now you're supposed to use a heat shrink gun, but I don't have one. I mean a heat gun. I don't have a heat gun. So I've been using the torch and I just keep it moving and it's been working pretty well. Once these things kind of cool down, they get kind of an opaque color. But man, I was pulling on them and they are really in there. They do grab pretty pretty darn well. All right, let's check and see how these are working. It's, like, it's nice to check as you progressively work, just make sure you didn't miss anything. Um, you know what works perfect for this is a cordless tool battery. This is an 18 volt and it's not fully charged which means we're not quite at 18 volts. These are 12 volt lights, it'll work perfect. Pretty sharp. All right, we've got to punch a hole for this hydraulic to go through. And it's got to drop down and then run to the back of the trailer. I think I'm going to drop down over here. And that's going to clear up the maximum amount of room for a potential winch in this area at some point. Or I punch through right here. And then when I do the winch, I can re-plumb to over here. This trailer is too big to fit in my shop. I gotta work out here in the dark. Now that hydraulic unit, head unit, is rated for load holding. But you know if those hydraulics ever develop any leak or anything like that, then your rating just goes away. So this is the emergency lock or the safety lock, whatever you want to call it here. Just the manual lock. I got these hydraulic hose retainers here. The two pieces of rubber and they're held in place by two bolts and a little metal plate. They're uh, really ideal. And I just welded those on every 24 inches. And it's actually a really nice day today. So the key is to leave a tiny bit of slack in these things, in this hose. Because on a cold day, it's gonna really restrict constrict.
All right, we've got to make up some battery cables here. So this is just some eight gauge wire. I've got two of them twisted together into this terminal here. One of them goes to the battery. One of them goes to a grounding block on the frame. So this side will mount on our power unit. What I've got is a little bit of flux on this wire to clean it. I've got the terminal upside down to act as a cut. I've got my heat shrink tubing moved far enough away that it's not going to get melted. Now what we're going to do is direct all of our heat onto this terminal. We're going to fill that thing up like a cut with our solder. There you have it. Just what the doctor ordered and this is the smallest heat shrink tubing I had that would fit over this terminal but I think it's still a little bit too big. Let's see what we can do here. Keep that flame moving. You know with the ground it's definitely not as crucial to cover it as it is with the positive terminal. But it, it definitely makes your job look a little bit neater, your work. Okay, that one's hardened up enough, that's not gonna fall off. Let's go to our next one here. So same thing, the wire goes into the flex. That's gonna clean our wire so that we can get a good connection. And I'm actually gonna fold this over I've already got the heat shrink tubing on there. Nice snug fit, same thing. Treat it like a cup. And you know, I've got this clamp here. If this tries to fall out or tries to hang or make that angle awkward, you can just clamp it to where it looks about right. Something like that. Okay, same thing. All of our heat gets directed onto our terminal. You can see that flux start to bubble. That means you're ready for solder. Feed that solder in until it spills over the edge. And then you know it's full. Right there. Give a little tiny bit more to top it off. There it is. Okay, heat shrink tubing. Let that cool a little bit. It's still possible to pull that wire out. As long as that flux is, I mean that solder is liquid, you can pull it out. egg that one out a little bit with a drill bit. When you have to do that on these, the key is to not put the next size up drill bit in here. It's put a small drill bit and work your way around. Otherwise it just grabs and it yanks it and bends it all up. A little trick I like to do, especially when you're using small gauge wires like this into a terminal or a fuse block or whatever you're putting together, you know, if you if you imagine that terminal trying to pinch that little wire, you might not get that great of a purchase on it, but if you double that wire over like that, you know, cut them a little bit long, strip them back a little bit long, twist them up, and then fold them over. That gives you a lot better of a grab on there. And it's really 
almost a necessity when you have two different gauge wires like this so these are both grounds this is a heavier gauge wire than this you almost have to by necessity double that smaller gauge otherwise you get an uneven clamp and then that one the smaller gauge is always going to be loose so now if you look here in a situation like this you have this really heavy heavy ground and I want to ground this trailer to my battery that runs the hydraulic unit also so I've got these two different wires drastically different gauges let's do this let's divide a little bit of this one here and let's add the rest over here and that's going to give us two that are approximately the same size the depth gauge on my saw set to one and a half inches which is exactly what this measurement is here from the frame rail to the edge of the stake pocket. So all we're going to do is we're going to take the square, we're going to line it up here on our line, as you can see, and we're going to use it as a fit. So we know that our depth is going to be perfect. So anytime you're plunge cutting with any type of saw or any blade, make sure you check the bottom. You know, whether you're cutting into a nice pair of saw horses or maybe even a sacrificial piece of wood or metal, always know what's underneath your cut.
You know, another quick tip, anytime you're slugging a piece of wood like this, it always helps to use the side of your, your hammer here. Instead of just the round face of it, you're gonna damage a lot less of the wood. You're spreading out that force across more surface area. And if you have to, you know, use a sacrificial piece here. When you drive these screws in, you don't want to suck them down so deep and so far that you're only getting half of the wood holding potential. Not only that, but you're going to have little puddles every time that it rains, and those little puddles are just going to absorb into that wood and rot that wood out around that screw. If you keep these somewhat flush, that water is going to evaporate out anytime it does rain instead of rot the wood. quite happy with the way this one grabs so we're actually going to pull this down a little bit setting this first board here you want to maintain consistency all the way down because this is what's setting all of your other boards so I'm at 9 and 3 8 9 and 3 8 and 9 and 3 8 so I'm holding true and I want to maintain that the whole way down you know another thing that really is noticeable when you first walk up and look at a trailer is the fasteners too. If you've got a line of fasteners that looks like a snake, it just looks like sloppy workmanship. You know, you keep your fasteners in a nice straight line, that really complements the workmanship, really shows that you care. So I'm just laying my fasteners out one inch from the end of the board. If this was a 2x12, I'd be using three fasteners. This is a 2x8. So I'm just doing two fasteners towards the edges of the board to prevent cupping. So right here I was presented with a small dilemma. Or not even really a dilemma, I knew what I wanted. I wanted my board lines to line up the whole way down the trailer. Well, what that is going to mean is I'm going to have a small filler piece here on each side in addition to a possible filler piece down the center. Now, if that gap in the center is small enough, I'm not going to worry about a filler piece. But I did have to worry about one here. No big deal. I'd rather have the boards line up the whole way down the trailer. It looks a little better in my opinion.
right now in keeping true with the theme here as far as the paint goes and a lot of this recycled metal on this trailer I've got some old cans of stain hanging around I'm gonna dump those in this bucket I've got some boiled linseed here left over from when I did my bed floor and I've got some lacquer thinner which is a great um, reducer for these products because it's not going on metal as you know I'm not a big fan of using lacquer thinner to um, reduce oil based paint for stains stuff that's going in wood I think it's an okay option we're gonna roll this on in order to keep it off of the metal and really keep it concentrated on the wood so let's get everything combined in here and we'll see what we're dealing with now when I do put on deck sealer I usually just go and buy five gallons of Thompson's water seal I think that's a great product affordable and then apply that every several years with a, uh, a Hudson sprayer a pump sprayer you know a little bit of overspray on the metal no big deal well with this lacquer thinner in here I don't want it to soften my paint so I'm really gonna try to keep it under control and that's why we're gonna be rolling it today and the only reason why we are adding that lacquer thinner is simply to thin this to get it to really bite down in that wood. Okay. I think that'll do it. I'm going to hang on to these just in case I have a little bit of residual. I'm going to store it in those cans. Dollar store whisk. Can't go wrong. Okay, let's get to it. Okay, quick change of plan. I'm going to get rid of as much of my stain as I can. This is dark walnut. I think I'm going to be able to do a few applications and get rid of most of this. So, on goes the dark walnut. Now, this was some stuff that I saved from the trash can. Somebody was going to throw it away, and I said, oh, no, I'll use it. And then, go figure, it kicks around my shop for over a year, and I don't use it. So, this is the perfect place to get rid of it just like we did with the old paints you know dump them all in a container put them on normally I'm not a big fan of coloring a deck because the more it fades the harder it is to match and the crappier it looks So this is coat number three going on here and you can see it is really souped on there. So the plan from here is basically to let this soak in for 10 days, uh, maybe two weeks and then we'll come across and pressure wash it because what it's going to do during those two weeks is just collect dust and collect dirt. It's going to look uh, really terrible probably by the end of the two weeks Then we'll come back through and we'll pressure wash it really clean and that will be exactly what we're after at that point. A nice sealed surface that is not too slick. 
and should last us a long time. Well, that's pretty much it. There's a few things that I will be addressing down the road. One is, I think I'm going to put the spare tire underneath here. What I'm considering using is one of those strap winches right here, and then a pulley under the trailer that pulls the tire up. I, with all my measuring, it looks to me like the tire would not hang below that frame rail right there, and that'd be a perfect way to kind of keep it up and underneath there, out of the sunlight and secure. And then you would basically just need a lug wrench to lower it down. That's kind of what I'm aiming for. The other thing is, I haven't quite perfected this yet. So this is the lock unlock, and it's spring loaded. So the way that I've been doing it is just wedging a board in here pulling it down, wedging a board in, and then the trailer will load, pull the board out, and it springs back up into place once it's high enough. I'm not sure how to make it so that I don't need this. I still am kind of playing around with ideas in my head on that. I'd like to keep it very clean. One thing I regret not doing is backing this with another piece of metal. So now when you look at it, the R, the P, and the O are all blown out. This O stayed, go figure, that one blew out. Other than that, I think I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. One other thing I'd like to do before I call it completed for now is I'd like to just test the capacity of this back ramp while I'm sitting in my yard. I think what I'm gonna do in order to test it is pull my truck up on there, my old 53, just the front, and then uh, see if it can lift that front up. So the process here is up, lift it up, and we gotta come down here and flip it into the unlock position. I don't know if you can see, but you can see those are now clicked down below the cross member. Now when it comes down, it's basically just going to push them. They are spring-loaded, like I mentioned. And now it's just a matter of hitting down. Okay, let's put the truck on there. I thought we'd check and see what our angle was here, our load angle. What is that, about 13 degrees? So 13 degrees load angle. Well, it definitely sucked the juice right out of the battery, but it did it. And one other project I think that I'll tackle along with that spare tire is right here. So I have a solar maintainer that would fit perfectly on top of this box, but it seems like every trailer that I've seen with a solar maintainer on the toolbox, eventually it gets broken, cracked. So I'm thinking about building some type of really cool cage with expanded mesh and then possibly setting some load lights here along the back. Maybe two faced out each way towards the end of the trailer. Maybe two faced onto the deck of the trailer. And then incorporate the uh, solar panel into that also along with an expanded mesh kind of guard over the top. So those are two be continued projects.
okay? Okay, we're working on the spare tire. I just quick sketched up these put these lines in here just as a reference for when I'm breaking these and I'm just gonna break these right in my vise here Bottom. What do you think of that? Good. Okay, so now the strap wraps around and it goes across. And that's going to hold it, just like that. Think it'll work? Yeah. Probably have to get a little bit longer of those. Just like so. Okay, so here's what we got. We got these tapped in holding the strap. We've got our studs. And these each get a fender washer. This goes under here. This pops up. And these get a fender washer. They get a star lock washer. And this is valve stem down, by the way. And then a wing nut. hand tight. Just like so. 
Okay, so we've got that run up through our bolt up on the top. Strap runs back over the frame rail, right between there, over the roller, onto our capstan. So let's see what we got. Okay, the last thing I want to do is slip some of this up between the frame and the tire. Okay, that feels pretty good. I think that's exactly what we were after. I like it and if you look at it level with the bottom of the frame rail it barely sticks down so I really don't foresee that being a problem at all. Alright check it out I got this trailer here. It's a Zeman deck over. 20k GBW. It's got super singles. And uh, actually, my brother and I just bought this to flip it. But check out this deck height. It's over 36 inches tall to the deck height. Not only that, but you see how this deck is set down below the frame, below the outside frame of the trailer. That makes it very hard to load stuff with a forklift. So we've got a 36 inch plus deck height. Now here's my trailer, still have this truck sitting on it. And uh, you can see as, my as it sits here, my trailer's tilted a little bit to the back. So let's go near this axle, set of axles here and take a deck height measurement. Okay, to the dirt. We've got a 24 inch deck height. Now we do have a load on here, so it'll probably come up about an inch, so 24, 25 inch deck height. Over an entire foot lower than that trailer. Now, given that trailer does have a 20,000 pound GVW, which is much higher than my trailer. So the cool thing about this hitch is if you don't quite get it pulled all the way to the, the front part of the ball here, um, it still will spring load down and now as soon as I pull forward it will lock into place. Up the 1935 Chevy or GMC, rather, the thing went through a fire really bad fire. A lot of this iron on here lost its temper. I was hoping to be able to save some of it or at least sell it as yard art. I had zero interest, and uh, like I said, I salvaged a bunch of the sheet metal up near the front that wasn't super warped or damaged. Real shell. Headlight bezels, fenders, hood, dash, but all of this stuff was distorted or tweaked or like these rims here. I thought I might be able to salvage some of the rims, but no, I wouldn't trust those things going down the road. So it hurts a little bit anytime you have to scrap old American iron, but it is what it is. I did my best, uh, but the trailer's loaded up. Let's go ahead and tow it to the scrapyard and see how we do. Okay, just. Went through the scale, we weighed 17,860 pounds. And uh, we're taking this back to their far driveway. And uh, he did mention there was a $5 per tire deduction on those front two tires. 
You can always tell what metal prices are doing by how much inventory the scrapyard is holding on to. And uh, we scaled at 4,680 pounds. They gave us uh, 120 bucks a net ton. And I had two tires at five each deducted off of that. Um, but it, it did great, towed fine. Not a bad load, worthwhile. Um, I'm always a little leery of, of heading through the scrapyard there. There's always nails and bolts and pieces of wire and other sharp objects all over the ground. They do a pretty good job of keeping the pathways swept, but it's always a possibility that you're gonna pick something up out of a pothole or a crack that they miss. One of those things, calculated risk. I checked my tires before I pulled back out on the street and uh, we didn't pick anything up this time. The other thing is I, I wish I could have got more footage of the uh, loading and unloading there, but they are they work quick there. They're really fast and efficient. Okay, let's go ahead and summarize this project. So, uh, how I ended up with a fender trailer as opposed to a deck over. I mentioned in the, in the first video that I was talking to a friend of mine who knows a lot more about tire and wheel combinations than I do. My original plan was to run low pros on this. He discouraged that. He said they wear out quicker. If you ever have any trouble on the road and you have to buy a tire, somewheres where you've broken down, he said you're not gonna find one. Mm -hmm. uh, the pros and cons didn't pencil. It worked out better to just go with something standard. In turn, that put my deck height a lot higher than I originally wanted. So mm -hmm. we've ended up now with a fender trailer. I've been able to work around the fenders. You can see they are a little uh, scratched up and um, worn from stuff going over top of them. I haven't bent them yet. They have held up very well. Uh, wood versus steel was another toss up. Personally, I prefer wood because I haul a lot of steel and steel on steel can get really slick, especially during the winter months. Uh, wood is a little bit cheaper outright and if you keep it sealed, it does hold up pretty well. Uh, this has, since I originally did it, has been sprayed once now with diesel and it has been sprayed once with a regular oil-based sealer. I usually catch it when I'm doing something else. We did a big concrete job and we had mm -hmm. diesel out for all the forms. I went ahead and hit my trailer deck with some of the excess diesel. Uh, I was sealing all my my fencing here on my personal property. I had a little bit left over. I went ahead and hit my trailer deck. Just one of those things. Keep maintaining it and it should last. Things I would do differently now that the project mm -hmm. is done. Um, I didn't add any chain storage. I just have the toolbox up front. It's full of all my tie down straps currently. No room for chains or binders. That was one thing that I was really on the fence about when I was doing the the welding, the iron fabrication on this trailer was, do I make some type of drawer or basket for chains and binders? I didn't. Um, I probably should have, whether it be a hatch that opens on the deck and um, reveals a, a basket, expanded mesh basket for chains and binders, whatever. Something like that would have been handy. Currently, I've got all my chains and binders in a milk crate that I bungee cord to the front. A little substandard for for me the other problem I've been running into is my battery that's a deep cycle battery it's I'm the second owner previously it was on a trolling motor on a boat and it's getting tired a couple of times now the beaver tail hasn't been able to lift up um, loads that it easily should have been able to and 100% is due to the battery so uh, I'm gonna have to put a bigger battery in most likely 
And the only other thing that I've really noticed is when I lift this beaver tail up and then let it drop back down on the locks, now that everything is kind of settled in and uh, broken in, it's not quite 100% in line with the rest of the trailer. And all that that entails is me taking a little eighth inch shim and welding it on top of the lock. And that way it stays in there and it shims that back of that trailer up slightly. Other than that, it's been a great trailer. I've gotten a lot of good use out of it and a couple of friends have even borrowed it. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.